That's the sound of someone in crisis, sending a text message that could read, I'm afraid to go to class because I'll be bullied. Or, I don't want to cut myself. Can you help? Within five minutes, a trained counselor will respond. Hi, my name is Sara. It sounds like you have a lot on your mind today. Do you want to tell me a little bit more about what's going on? Crisis Text Line, or CTL, is the first national 24-7 intervention hotline exclusively by text messaging. It offers anonymity, and it's as easy as 741741. Welcome to the 42 Podcast, where we discuss life together, looking for answers to life, the universe, and well, everything else. Here are your hosts, Rob and Lindsay. Why, hello, Robert. Hey, Lindsay. How you doing? I'm doing well on this fine Monday morning. Different for us. Uh, Yeah, it is a bit of a Monday. Sorry, it just crossed over. It is Monday afternoon. Oh, it is, isn't it? Ah. Yeah, it was a bit of a weird weekend. We didn't get to record on our uh, nor- normal time, and uh, hmm. here we are. So so why is that? <laughs> because I had a date with destiny. Oh, boy. And a trampoline. Oh. And my knee. <laughs> <laughs> so have you seen, like, those um, trampoline parks that they have? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We went and visited the in-laws down in Baltimore and went with my nieces and my mother-in-law and the kids. And uh, we went to one of those trampoline parks. Mm -hmm. And what's great is we got onto the trampolines and I start bouncing on the one I'm on. And I can do, I don't think I can do it anymore, but I I can do flips on a trampoline and get some cool air, do some little goofy stunts and tricks that I always had fun with as a kid and even as an adult of, oh wait, Rob can actually, you know, do that on a trampoline. It's one of those fun little throws people. (laughs) Well, Melinda was, you know, yelling at me, you you keep doing that, you're going to hurt yourself, you're going to hurt yourself. I, I was fine. But then we went over and I was showing Ray how to do the Ninja Warrior stuff on one of the courses. And I was going along and I lost my grip on one of the rings and the handhold and I fell and uh, <clears throat> twist, pop, and grind. I, my oh. knee was... It, it was one of those when I hit and I felt that twist, pop, grind. It was just that fast. I knew it wasn't right, so... I got to spend the rest of my afternoon at the emergency room and, you know, is getting the the x-rays and all of that. And it looks like it's just a bad sprain right now. But uh, my knee's in a brace and I'm on crutches for two weeks. Oh, do you have to do therapy or anything? Any any discussion as far as that goes? I may. We'll we'll see on that one. When I hurt my knee the last time, I, I did some physical therapy so i might just try and do some of that at home yeah i mean the last time it was a hyperextension of my left knee this time it's a sprain in my right knee it looks like so we'll we'll figure that one out a bit it's got a heel i have a brace on and i can kind of stand on it a bit with the brace but otherwise i'm i'm hobbling around on crutches oh that stinks which is just it's it's funny (laughs) <laughs> Let's just admit it. It's funny. My kids find it to a degree funny. Some of my friends and family find it funny. Me trying to navigate on crutches because I'm stubborn. <laughs> you know, I'm that guy who will use the crutch to open the door and fall. You know, get out of my way. I'll do it myself. <laughs> but that's my life update from a weekend. You know, oh, so exciting. But we were going to talk a little more about you yeah so i know that there's a lot more people listening to the podcast than than before some some people are new newer to the podcast and i was thinking that people that have started with us from the beginning know that i i am a completely different person than i was 
six months ago and a year from or a year ago. And there's a lot that's gone on. So I, I mentioned to this this earlier of I was talking to one of our listeners. It was actually yesterday. And they were even saying there's a huge difference in you that they've heard from when you and I started. Because when you and I started, this really was a Christian and an atheist sitting down and kind of duking it out in some ways. But we also had a friendship that we were leaning on from the past to to be able to have those discussions. So just in, in the discussions, in your voice, there are differences that people have noticed. So I do think it's fair to kind of what is going on. Yeah, I wasn't in a good spot in October, November, when we started this. So I, I'm, I'm not so great off the cuff with real intense stuff. I, I want to get across in the right way. So mm-hmm. I'm going to be a little lame and just sort of read what I've got. And uh, you're okay. And then, yeah, you we can discuss it. Yeah. Is that right? All right, go for it. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about this past winter and how my journey has been progressing. I am not the person I was in November, December, or January. I've done a lot of changing this past year and a half, and a lot of it you already know. But starting late fall, it all culminated into this awful crescendo that slammed me down and pinned me there. For those of you just listening now and who haven't started from the beginning of of the podcast, the premise of the show had been an atheist and a Christian talking about life. This was very new for me. For the first time, I did not believe God was there. And if he wasn't there, then everything I had always been sure of and could rely on became putty. My moral compass was basically broken, and now I had to decide for myself which way was which. At this time, a few things happened together. First, I admitted to the world in this podcast that all my life I had been deeply ashamed and hid from the fact that I was gay. Gay is a broad stroke word, and it can mean a wide range of things. I knew that I was, for the most part, attracted to women, that the big crushes I have had in my life and a few that ran much deeper than that, well, one that ran much deeper than that, were women. It seemed like right around this time things started to fall apart between my husband and I. It was very sudden, but I found one night that I had no sexual feelings for him at all. None. I felt devastated, crushed. I communicated this to him. I wasn't sure how, and I thought about it for a couple days, trying to figure out how I was going to tell him this. But I did. I remember I was sitting in a chair, and he was kneeling in front of me, and he just held me tight. He just held me so tight. Over the course of the next few days and weeks, we talked a lot. I hated the thought of him being stuck with me in a marriage without intimacy or romantic love. We talked about all the possibilities and options, and had pretty well settled on getting a divorce, as awful as that thought was. However, the thing I could not stomach was how much it would hurt my children and my family. My therapist encouraged me that everyone would be okay, and to keep strong and be true to myself. Maybe, just maybe, I could meet a woman who would sweep me off my feet and we could be happy together. But how in the hell could I be happy with someone, no matter how wonderful they were, knowing what it cost my kids? It felt so immensely wrong to split up the family just so that I could go and date a woman. 
I just didn't, I just didn't think I could live with that. I couldn't hurt them like that. But yet things weren't changing between Colby and I. I was really tormented. I was really torn. It was at this time I pretty seriously contemplated suicide. I fantasized about driving off the road or into oncoming traffic. Of course, the kids would be sad and hurt, and I felt terrible about that, but at least it would be a clean break for them, and then Colby could go on with his life and meet someone who could give him everything that he deserved. I started cutting at this time, too. I just couldn't cope with my feelings. Anger and disgust at myself, which boiled over at times to such an extent that I took it out on those I loved most. I felt like when I cut, I could literally watch the anger bleed right out of me and vent that toxicity off. One day something occurred to me, though. At the onset of fall, I had talked to my primary care physician about my anxiety and the struggle I had controlling my emotions, and I was prescribed risperidone. It was a pill I could take as needed, and one thing I noticed right off was that it made me really stupid. It helped with the anxiety and leveled out my emotions, but I had a very hard time connecting thoughts together. I wondered if there could possibly be any sexual side effects of taking the drug. I did two seconds of research, and yes, it is known to have an effect on libido. Could it be that the bad experience I'd had was because of the drug? I hoped so. Simultaneously, another thing that occurred to me was if I was willing to literally kill myself to make my children and husband happy, then I sure as heck had it in me to do whatever it took to try to make us work. I decided that I absolutely did not want to go live my own life and try out the experiences I never got to have as a repressed gay person. It wasn't worth it to me. I wanted to keep our family together. I wanted to be Colby's wife more. I wanted to make us work. After that, I'm not even sure exactly what happened. But I think it started with a lot of communication. I decided then that I wanted to change. I stopped taking that drug. That doesn't mean that I'm not attracted to women. Or that somehow that pill is responsible for making me temporarily gay. I'm just saying it did have an impact on decreasing my libido to nil things started to turn around. I realized how much I did love Colby. And part of that, I think, was really living and sitting with the possibility of not being with him anymore. I realized how much I did love him and how much I was willing to fight for us. Things have gotten much better, wink wink, in every way. And along with that... <laughs> I I don't know what I'm doing over here because you got me laughing and crying all at once. <laughs> but but you're doing great. I'll shut up. You keep going. That's the hardest part. I I had to write down all that stuff because it was the hardest part. But as far and as far as my relationship with God goes, it, it's I'm just letting things happen organically and, and trying and trying to be open and um trying to be honest with God and tell him tell him what's wrong tell him look I've got these problems but I I want to I want to be a better person I, Yeah wow sorry I I want to laugh I want to cry and I want to hug you and Colby By the way I would really like to meet Colby someday <laughs> <laughs> I you, you have spoken highly of him and, uh, you know, from what I see of him as, as a father, as a husband, through through you, through social media, I would like to meet him. Yeah. So one of these days we do need to get our families together 
that would be great. And uh, you and Colby working through this. Not just tossing the towel in, but talking and trying to figure it out. And I don't know what to say to that because it's extremely commendable and incredibly rare. And it's beautiful to see. It really is. And and I get the joy of that because, you know, you, you guys are, are friends. But, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, th- there's a, a list of things running through my head where it's, okay, w- w- which one do I want to ask first? Mm. And, and I guess I kind of want to camp on this topic a little bit. But you said about cutting. That you're not doing that anymore, are you? No, I stopped that a long time ago. I stopped that oh, a long time God. ago. During the winter, sometimes. Yeah, really, really, you know, it all... Something that helped everything turn around was just making the decision that it was worth it, that it was worth fighting for. That changed things. And I started exercising. And that helped me a lot. That helped my mood. That helped straighten things out a lot. There are all kinds of fun chemicals that hit when you exercise. And it's amazing. Because even even when I've been exercising, it really helps with depressions and and things like that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, exercise is really good. And I did see someone. I mean, I was seeing a therapist, and I was telling them everything that was happening, everything that was happening. It was pretty dark for a little while. It was really dark for a while. But it just started to change. It just... And I know I had people praying for me. I I do kind of want to visit even what your therapist said, because I I think there's more to that. But I want to kind of continue with this for a moment, because... The whole cutting thing to me is incredibly terrifying, especially in, in my line of work when I'm dealing with teenagers. Because I, I've had a handful of teenagers over the years who that's been a part of how they have expressed and handled their emotions. And that terrifies me. It it really does. It, you know, to anyone who's out there who is cutting... That it's not an answer. It it's not going to help. It's you will do more long term damage. Find someone you can talk to. Find someone who can love you for you. Yep. And support you to get through that because it's not okay. And it's weirdly addicting. It's that pain. You know, working out gives you those endorphins and all those fun chemicals. And it's the cheap way to get around that. And it's the insincere, shallow way to get around that. Because some of those same things kick in when you get hurt or injured. Mm -hmm. But it's also a degree of feeling like you have a physical control over an emotional state. Mm -hmm. And and you can't always get the control over emotions physically. So. Yep. Yeah, I, if that's something you deal with, I mean, seek help. Uh, reach out to us. I mean, I, I've dealt with this with teens in the past, and, you know, I, I love my students, and I'll be there for them. I'll be there for anyone with this, because I, I get that. I'm. All right, moving away from that. I, I want to kind of ask you something. Yeah. Because your therapist told you one thing, and you've gone in a different direction. You said about your therapist told you to, you know, seek what made you happy. Yeah, she was pretty pushy. I had to push back after a couple weeks. It was probably a month and a half of her telling me stuff. And she was trying to tell me what she thought I wanted to hear or needed to hear or something. And I I was afraid to tell her, like, I, I don't want to leave. I, I'm staying. I don't want to go. And so when I told her that and really put my foot down with her and pushed, pushed back, She started to change her tune a little bit, and we talked about other things, but, yeah, she was pretty pushy. Yeah, I, sorry, just in in how you said about that, there's, I think there's a conversation to be had of, 
you were looking at the happiness that you have had as a family, what you have sought to build with Colby in, in the kids, in the relationship, and then kind of going away from that. And I, I, to me, that speaks of, you know, the, the happiness of a moment, the shallowness of a moment and clinging that to that forever versus the happiness that is entrenched in building something that has good, bad, and difficult at every level. You know, something that is more certain and foundational in a life than just a passing happiness. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to get your thoughts on some of that. With Is that something that you, you truly felt and considered and, and were navigating with this? Is that... So what you're kind of saying is that before all this happened, we were, quote, happy, but in a superficial way. And then after the crap hit the fan and we did find happiness again, it could be much more rich because of what we've been through and what we knew we were, you know, I guess I don't know really. Partially. 100%. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's partially it because as you hit these kind of speed bumps, I mean, Melinda and I can look back at hard moments we've had in our marriage from early to just in the past couple months. And those hard moments don't eliminate the happiness. They just kind of inform it a little because it's no, this is worth fighting for Mm -hmm. and fighting to, to have a better relationship. You know, the relationship I have with her from today to the relationship I had with her year one are entirely different. Yeah. You know, year one was more superficial. This is more entrenched and not in a a negative way. You know, I, for me to leave or lose my wife would be to lose half of who I am right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she and I have been married for 13 years. And, And so it's, it's also that, but it's also then the reflection of the superficial happiness that your therapist kind of was saying, well, find your happiness. It's almost. Yeah. Just chase what makes you happy, and, and and that's all you need. Don't work at building. Just chase what makes you happy. Right. And I and I kind of tried to embrace that for a little while, for a couple of weeks, maybe a month and a half. That's where we lived, that, that I was going to leave, that we were going to figure out the right time for me to leave, and I was going to, you know, get a job and save my own money so I could have an apartment. I mean, like, we thought this out really pretty thoroughly. And we lived there for, hmm. it might have been as long as two or three months. Wow. Yeah, all right. I need to buy Colby a whole freaking bar. Yeah. This dude is, he's amazing. <laughs> he's the guy that, um... He tried to do what was best for you and for the kids. Is this, would that be a good summary? Yeah. He was wanted me to be happy. He wanted me to be happy. And during this three months, he didn't want to keep me if I didn't want to stay. And he was so supportive. And I didn't really... He doesn't emote much. And he, t- he tends to maul over things. So he was... I think he was devastated for a long time. And grieved for a long time, and I didn't really know because it was so under the surface. And I would find out much later that how much he was wrecked. He was pretty wrecked. And, uh, mm. but we just sort of climbed out of a crap hole. And I mean, it really goes beyond reason. Like, nothing. It was just, it sort of happened, and and now things are genuinely better than they've ever been. And I think we both believe that God saved our marriage, and God saved us. That is phenomenal. I've got a couple friends who are going through a divorce, divorces right now, and uh, they're never pretty. But the work that it takes to, to rebuild from that point, from saying, I think it's over, to no, maybe not. It's not pretty, but it's like a rosebush not pretty, where, you know, it's thorny, it's painful, 
but man, when that flower comes out, when, when you get to that point where you're looking and saying, no, this, this has been worth it to rebuild from that end, there's a beauty to that. There is, there are deeper roots that you guys truly are setting in your relationship, in your marriage, and in what your kids will be able to do, which, you know, that in and of itself is phenomenal because your kids will have seen directly or indirectly that you guys have fought through something they may not know all the details but that you have fought through something and that relationships are worth that yep you know a spouse is worth that yeah okay so if i may ask and you can again tell me to shut up and edit this section out how how have the kids been through all of this i mean again kids can pick up on tensions between mom and dad as far as I know, they don't know anything happened. Wow, okay. See, this isn't necessarily a good thing, but Colby and I never fight in earnest in front of anybody. E- even just by ourselves, we don't really fight. We're both mullers. We just... I mean, we'll argue sometimes, but, but we've never fought uh, really... Well, how do you figure that's a bad thing? Let me ask you that. I don't think it's healthy, maybe, to just go sit on something for two or three weeks and let it sit there, and and then when it finally comes up, then it's sort of, like, more of a big deal. And not even that we explode at each other, but it just turns into something else until until it can be discussed. Or it just Hmm. eats away at you and just... But but you guys will sit down, you'll have a discussion over whatever... The topic is that's festering so it's not something that you just let sit for years oh no we talked extremely candidly during this whole process it's kind of our superpower i think as a couple is when we decide to we we talk we're very transparent with each other and could talk things out but it was part of it was my concern that i i did not want the kids to know or to feel insecure i did not want them to feel insecure at all until until we really were going to do something about it. And see, I, you, you're saying that, and you were saying it in a, a negative context for how you guys can be, but that's not what I'm seeing from an outside perspective with what you're describing, because it's, if you guys are talking and communicating, you don't need to have an all out fight. You don't need to have that screaming match in the kitchen. You can process through and, being able to take the time you need to think and then express as healthily as you can Mm. what you're thinking and feeling and then discuss that it's still a fight in and of itself it's just not the kind of fight that gets portrayed in very media or (laughs) is expected it is it's probably a better way to fight i mean if you're letting it fester and sit for years and or months on end without any intention of we're going to talk about it, that's dangerous. That's a a relationship killer. But if it's, no, I need the emotional time and space to process, I'm I'm not going to let this just fade away. I just, I need the time to process. That's fine. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, I say that in entirely fair full disclosure you know mel and i are the we're gonna have a screaming match in the kitchen (laughs) uh we're we're not hotheads in how we fight but you know we're both very one of you is scottish and the other one is a redhead so (laughs) she's irish i'm scottish (laughs) i i'll also admit this it's something i had to learn to control i have a very deep-rooted anger that is kind of like i i've had counseling for it deep-rooted anger it's it's terrifying to me in some sense i get that yeah and i'm at the point in my life where the only person who can push me to that it's a blind rage the only person who can push me to that is melinda and early in our marriage i mean that was something that i knew existed but i didn't know how to express and the first time she pushed me to that it was understanding that okay i i'm trying to retreat in our fights because i know i'm reaching my emotional capacity and i just need to cool down before i say anything further and 
nothing abusive has ever happened, but she has seen that, okay, wait a minute, there is a, a point where I have to pull back. And you feel that ugliness in you. You feel, I mean, okay, I won't speak for you, but I <sighs> have felt in me that I am really this close, I'm this close to shaking my kid. This close. This close. And that makes you feel like a monster. No, that's that's incredibly and accurately true, where it's, you know, it, you're, you're standing on the brink going, I, I need to pull back because this is where I can go with this is really bad, really quick. And, you know, it, it, it is terrifying. It is horrifying to to have to understand that about yourself, that there is an anger that when pushed to that point, you, you're, you're trying to rein in every piece of who you are and retreat to just build that emotional buffer back up and process again. Mm -hmm. that, that's the way I phrase it. And, you know, again, that's even part of learning what it is as a husband and a wife, where Mel had to learn that about me, that that that's a piece of who I am. It's not something I, I want in my life. It's not something I desire to have in my life. But when I have to retreat to emotionally process, she can't keep pushing me. And then vice versa. I, I've She doesn't have the same anger that I do, but I have found that I can push her to her breaking points. And those aren't okay either. I think I covered this in swearing where there was one point in our marriage where I pushed her to the point where she swore. And for her, that was something that broke her. That was something that was deeply tied into to the emotions and, and thoughts that she was feeling, but also deeply tied into anger she's felt in the past. And I think it is healthy, though, for you and Colby to be able to give yourselves that mulling period. It may not always feel that way. But I think it's healthy for you guys to be able to do that, to mm. not, in your way, you probably do push each other to breaking points, but not in that kind of manner, where you're able to step back and say, no, I need to process, or I need to let him process. And then having an emotional maturity that when the topic comes back mm. up, it's not, oh no, how dare you bring up, it's, okay, we can talk about this, we can work through. Mm hmm and these are some assumptions just interacting with you so yeah and i've learned a lot i've conti i'm continuing to learn about colby and the fact that he is slow to emotionally process things he'll be completely fine with something that i say face to face he looks fine but emotionally he is way behind and he will catch up and then he will be angry <laughs> but it'll be 3 days later or he'll be devastated three days later. And and I, I've learned that I need to slow down and stop giving him input. Stop giving him more things to process. Slow down. Let him process one thing at a time. Because otherwise I'll put my foot in my mouth thinking that I know how he feels when I really don't. Because he doesn't know how he feels. <laughs> and, and again, I mean, that is also part of the joy of having a marriage where my wife is new every day. Who she is, what she thinks, what her thoughts are in the encounters and experiences we have, and even how she processes some of those. You know, um, this is the second time I've had a knee injury that's laid me up and limited my mobility. And it's like 11 o'clock Friday night. Mm -hmm. Friday night is the first and only time I, I took the Tylenol and codeine they prescribed for me for the knee injury. So she thinks I was a little tripped out on that. But I know what I said, and I stand by it, where looking at who my wife is as she's navigating what my limitations are, again, because of my knees, she's my hero. Mm. And watching the grace that she brings to the pride that I have where... You know, I'm, I don't do well with having others have to do things for me. I don't do well with that. Mm -hmm. But I can't put my pants on in the morning because <laughs> I can't lift my leg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not like sexy time. Hey, that's mm -hmm. like major humiliation. 
but she she navigates these issues in a way that I can only look at her with admiration and go, you're my hero. You're amazing. So a spouse and building that relationship, again, there's new every day in what you discover, what you learn, whether it's because of something old or something new and who you two then are developing together. You know, what the hopes and dreams that you and Colby have as you grow older. So I I don't know how you're going to feel with this question. But I I think it's also reflective of kind of that that growing arc. Have you and Colby ever thought, and my wife hates this question, about what Grandma Lindsay and Grandma Colby would look like? (laughs) I've thought about it. Yeah, I've thought about it as far as Colby goes, because he's going to be, he's going to (laughs) just, he's going to drive the kids crazy. He's going to tease them to no end, and he's going to be a funny old man. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But you're never going to age, right? Is that what you're saying? Is that why you're saying? Basically. You've only thought of him as an old man? Yeah, I've never thought of myself. Well, no, I guess I haven't really thought of what that will be like for me exactly except for in relation to Colby and how we are together I guess I can't even really comprehend grandchildren right now (laughs) And, and that's fair I mean you're still in diaper stage yeah but you know I my son's gonna turn 12 in less than six months and that's something that I'm starting to cope with where you know when I started working where I'm at now those kids who just graduated off this year, they were 10, 11, and 12, roughly. And, okay, wait a minute, what happened? Now my kid's that age, and it's just going to go quicker. Yep. And so, yeah. for me, it's just starting to process, what's that that grandparent stage going to look like? Mm. I mean, if Ray follows the track that I went on, I'm like 12 years away from being a grandfather. <laughs> That's weird. That's a weird thought. Yeah. He would be, uh, we had Ray and I was 24. So if he hits 24 and has a kid, I'm 48. That's 12 years. And that terrifies me, but it's also... I look at that, and it, it, it's also kind of exciting because it's well, what would, what would Melinda and I be like as grandparents? Which is really not that far away, so it's not like, in forty years, what will we be like? <laughs> Just over a decade. Yeah. How snarky we've been is Colby for over be? a decade? <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, uh, yeah, not just how snarky, but I mean. Okay, grandkid, how spoiled am I going to make him? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? What kind of I gotta come up with a whole new set of grandpa jokes, not just dad jokes. It's gotta be grandpa jokes now. <laughs> but it's fun to explore that even. And Mel doesn't like it because to her, it's I'm getting older. We're getting older. Yeah. And that is weird. It, it does feel weird when you sit with that for a minute and just go, wow. And then you start envisioning yourself as a grandparent and it's just, ooh, wow, that's. But to me, that's that's part of what I enjoy, where it's, I, I chose who I did because I want to grow old with her. Mm-hmm. And exploring what that growing old will be. And, I don't know, I'm stuck in a state of transition in my thoughts, but I, I think that's what you clung to. I think that's what you have sought to build in sticking with Colby and sticking with your family and not just chasing a superficial happiness. Mm-hmm. that blooms and then withers and you move to the next one that blooms and withers you've pursued something that will have seasons of of happiness and seasons of of bitterness but the end result is is that you are building something that is greater than and yeah you, you know I love I love you you know I I support you and you and I were talking, yeah, we were talking at this point. We were building the foundations of what this podcast would have been. Mm-hmm. I, I would have stuck stuck with you and 
we would have still built this as best as we could have mm-hmm. and navigated whatever your end decision would have been with family, with life. But I'm proud of you. I'm proud of what you've chosen. It's the harder path. But I think it's I think it's the one that will be more rewarding. Mm-hmm. I really do. Yep. Crisis Text Line is the brainchild of entrepreneur Nancy Lublin. Launched in 2013, while at the helm of DoSomething.org, the largest online youth organization, Lublin received a text message from a girl that stopped her in her tracks. She texted us saying that she was being raped by her father. Mm. And we thought, we can't just send her a phone number. We did. We sent her a hotline. But we realized that it was so much deeper. If you're going to share something that personal, that intimate, that horrific with strangers, there was a need for a text line. That text inspired CTL. To our listeners, we we love you. We appreciate you. You are valuable and important to us. Some of what Lindsay has talked about with suicide and and cutting and self-harm, these are important and hard topics. And if, if you're struggling with suicide, feel free to reach out. But also, first and foremost, reach out to the Suicide Prevention Hotline. Uh, and that's 1-800-273-8255. You can talk to someone immediately who will help you, who will help navigate what you're feeling, what you're dealing with. And these are people who are sympathetic, not just because they're trained to be sympathetic, but because they've been down some of these roads as well. They know what it is you feel. They know how desperate you feel. So if you have any issue, any need to talk to someone, first and foremost, call that hotline, and that is 1-800-273-8255. Call them. They understand. They're there to help. In the same way, if you struggle with things like self-harm, because whatever reason it may be, there's help for you too, and I've dealt with this with teens, and there's always help. There's always someone who wants to love you and speak with you and help you on this journey. And so if you need to talk, again, there's a hotline for this as well, and that's 1-800-273-8255. There is help. There's always help for you. And that that is the suicide prevention, and that is the self-harm hotlines. They, They cover both, so please do call. Please, please seek help. Because you are important, you are valuable, you matter. Lindsay, you want to add anything on that one? When you're in it, you're so myopic and everything feels so claustrophobic and and you feel like you're suffocating and like there's, there's no, there's no hope. But just hang in there. Hang in there. And... And Lindsay, I mean, I don't think we're done talking just yet, but I I do want to commend you for sharing what you've shared today, because that's, that's a lot. That's a lot that you said that you've been through, that, that you've journeyed through, and it's been, yeah, we're going into August, and, uh, you and I have been having these conversations, uh, building a podcast, and than what we've had as the podcast conversations since September. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know everything that you've gone through, but thank you for sharing because you are valuable to me as a friend, to your family, to to my family, to my wife, because we've known you for 2005, Mm -hmm. 16 years, 16 years. Yeah. You're, you're valuable. You losing you, we would have we would have grieved. We would have felt that loss. I appreciate that. I really do. You say you appreciate that, but I. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Neither do I. I'm gonna cry. We're crying together. <laughs> That's not a podcast. That's a, a cry cast. This is the point where having facial expressions would be better because I'm, I'm, yeah. You are valuable and important, Lindsay. Please never underestimate that. And your story is just beginning. 
That is, that I believe that. I believe that. I think that was a huge mistake I made, was I sort of thought I was done. Like, I'm, I'm done. I've had kids. I, I believed in God. Now I don't. Now what the heck do I do? As far as evolution goes, I've fulfilled my purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had kids. I procreated, yeah. and uh, now what? Yeah, and that's kind of what makes a- another sort of tick in the God being there column, because everybody I talk to has feels a sense of purpose or destiny or that they're not done. They're not done with life just because they had kids. And I think that doesn't make sense if, as far as just pure evolution goes. I think our sense of destiny should be over now because we've had kids, but unless God gives us that sense of destiny and purpose. And and you're dead on with that. I, I think there is, most definitely. And sorry, this ties into even a conversation I was having a bit with my father. I guess that would have been last week, where, you know, the relationship he and I have, father-son, has changed over the 36 years that I've been his son. But the relationship that I am guarding and protective of with my father, it's not the relationship he and I have. It's the relationship that he has as a grandfather. Mm. And not just to my kids, but even looking to the relationship he has with my nieces, looking to the relationship that he would have with any potential future nephews or nieces in my family. Because I, I I see who my father is. I know who my father is. And I guess this is going back into that, you know, Grandpa Lindsay, or Grandpa Lindsay. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grandma Lindsay and Grandpa Colby. Yeah. Conversation of, okay... You know, who are you going to be as grandparents? And seeing that in my own father, of who he is as a grandfather, and wanting that, not just for my kids, but my, my nieces, my future nephews and nieces. And, mm. you know, how, how important that relationship is. Where he's retiring, his job is, is done, but for him, there's still so much more. And I see it, and, and I think he sees it as well, but there's still so much more in what his life has to give beyond the career he's had and beyond the children because now it's the grandchildren it's that generational wisdom that he will pass on to my kids to the nieces to the future nephews and nieces because i see that in my own relationship with my grandfathers the things that i've learned from my grandfathers my my grandmothers and the value of life that is continued, that is the journey, the journey stops only when you die. And there's always something more to add to it. Always one more chapter, always one more page. Mm. I mean, to the end, and we've talked a little bit about this. Oh, man, that was many episodes ago. With walking through everything with my grandmother mm-hmm. and the Alzheimer's that she had, or dementia that she had. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, even to the end with that, there were things of faith that I tapped into from her that I learned from her because of that dementia. Her story got jumbled, but it didn't end. Mm -hmm. So life is of value. Those stories, those chapters are of value. Yep. I'm speaking too much. I'm... You're dead on. You're dead on. Can I ask a, a little more blatant accusing question now? I've, I've been... Oh, I know, you're making a face at me. Um, and, and this one, I, I have a very serious, you know, kind of accusation that you haven't done this yet. What? You're a phenomenal writer. <laughs> I had no idea what you were going to say. I, I know, I know. I'm doing one of those left turn moments. But you're a phenomenal writer, right? I appreciate that. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, when's the book coming out? This is the first thing I've written in a really long time. The thing that I read. We've tossed around the idea of writing a book together, and I think that's a great idea. I think that might be the kick in the pants to actually do it, you know? Cause... Oh, 
Oh, that was a hard serve right back in my no, face. No, no, I just mean, <laughs> I, I just mean like all by myself. I, it's hard to, it's hard to, like, what am I going to write about and what, what do I need to say? What do I need to say? I think that's what writing is for me is writing is, is a way to untangle complicated things and emotional things. Yeah, we did talk about writing what it would look like if we wrote something. Mm -hmm. Eventually. I'm just saying from you. And to be entirely fair, I don't think you have to start out with an, uh, you know, this is where I'm going. I think the journey can be, this is what I'm writing. I mean, look at what Tolkien did with the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm -hmm. He had the end goal, get the Mount Doom. How do we get there? And took three books to do it. Yeah. And a lot of words. Yeah. I know I've got I've got stuff I want to say and I've got a lot of <laughs> I just don't really I it's hard to narrow it down. It's hard for me to get focused. I don't know exactly what to focus on. I've had lots of ideas and I've tried a lot of times to write stuff. It just never is any it's either under my bed now in a folder or <laughs> I've done plays, and I love writing plays and things like that for church. I think that's... I like that. Oh. You mean, like, the human videos? Uh-huh. Yeah, I still have trauma from that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the, the one that we did, it was uh, Come Holy Spirit. I think I can say that. Mm -hmm. And we were practicing it once, but I was so tired that I was listening to the music instead of focusing on what I was supposed to be doing, and I was basically standing on my feet asleep. Yeah. The Those? Yeah. No. Yeah. I like to present things that we think we're, we know and are comfortable with and sort of putting a spin on it so that we look at it fresh. And I, that's what I like to do. I was just thinking today, actually, that I wanted to write something for christmas or easter or something you want to do a fun <gasps> oh i'm gonna hate this what 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 oh i'm really gonna hate <gasps> what? this i oh, know i'm excited if you hate it i'm gonna love it <laughs> what okay what if and i really hate this what if we went and wrote you and i mm -hmm. a short story and shared it. Wrote it together or mm -hmm. apart? Apart. Like you write one and then I write one and then we do a podcast where we read the short stories. Ooh, that sounds hard. <laughs> that sounds challenging and good. Scary. That sounds scary. I've got a short story kind of that was it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a creepy pasta Disney fanfic. How about that? <clears throat> I know. Oh. <laughs> lots of lots of weird words all put together. I I wrote one that was just it, it's a creepy pasta Disney fanfic. Cool. I'm excited to read it. So I don't know, maybe that's something I brush off and it's I'll say it's at like sixty percent, so maybe I finish that and hmm. you pick one that you wanna do and we just have a podcast where we read our short stories. Okay. I don't think I've ever gotten a short story past two or three pages, so it won't be much. Yeah, mine aren't usually too long either, actually. That'll be interesting. Good idea. It, but, I mean, it, your writing style is phenomenal, and you writing to express what you think and you feel... It really does have power because, again, it, you you found this. You're not walking alone in this life and in what you're going through. And and I think that's part of the power that is your story, that is your your journey. Uh, so I think you writing something like that has a lot of value, has a lot of oomph behind it, and just even in what you wrote this morning to read and. It's not the morning, it's the afternoon, but what you wrote to speak to today, I think that has a lot of power, and I, I want to encourage you to that writing for that. Thank you. Because <laughs> you have had an amazing journey, and I'm thankful to just be a fly on the wall for part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So.
And I really need to meet your husband one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm. So, it'll be interesting. <laughs> I I look forward to the chance that we get to get our families together and have some time. Mm. Mm-hmm. So. Alright. Yeah. You got anything else? I think I'm... I think I'm, I think I'm good. I think I'm spent. <laughs> uh, that is entirely understandable. You you put a lot out there today, and I appreciate that. Well, I hope your knee feels better, you big baby. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm... It's really stiff right now. I haven't moved for a bit, so it's hurting. So, I'm gonna get up and uh, hobble around on crutches and aggravate my wife again. So, you know. <laughs> but hey... You're doing great, Lindsay. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I'm glad to be able to share with you and update you. And I'm on the other side of the trajectory, but this is where it started, <laughs> if you get what I mean. Hey, but I'm thankful that I've gotten to be a part of that journey. <laughs> Just from a distance, I'm thankful too. And I'm thankful for everything you have shared today. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Have a good one. You too. Now, 40,000 text messages, the majority from teenagers, are exchanged each day with crisis counselors around the country. That's more than 11 million messages since it started. So in a way, you're growing faster than Facebook. We spread geographically faster than they did when they first launched. We launched quietly in Chicago and El Paso. And in four months, we were in every area code in the United States.